Vision. Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over the Music Man. Dave's obsession. Dave's obsession of the homo man. Ah, the Music Man. The beloved Broadway musical adapted into the beloved 1962 feature film and the not quite as beloved, 2003 Wonderful World of Disney special. The play was written by Meredith Wilson, and because I was born an 80-year-old man, I grew up knowing Wilson as the band leader on the Burns and Allen radio show. Uh, Meredith, I hate to wake you up so late, but I have an important question to ask you. Well, that's all right, Gracie. What's the question? Would you still like to get married? I certainly would. Well, meet Eddie Candace. Gee, I sort of planned on a woman. <laughs> On that show, Wilson portrayed himself as a shy, earnest man who was often intimidated by women, so basically the exact opposite of the title character of his most famous work. The titular music man is con man Harold Hill, who travels from town to town selling band instruments, uniforms, and lessons to the children, and then taking the money and running before they realize he has no idea how to teach music. But hey, they get to keep the instruments, so they have more to show for it than a lot of college degrees. The story begins when he arrives in the small town of River City, Iowa, a town so charming they eventually moved it to Connecticut and renamed it Stars Hollow, and later cut the pretense of specificity and named it Small Town USA. But while the town is charming, it's not exactly welcoming. At least not in a non-passive-aggressive way. You can't eat your fill of all the food you bring yourself. But Hill knows how to use their stubbornness and wariness of newcomers to his advantage, and the con is on. Robert Preston originated the role of Harold Hill on Broadway, and he returns to play him for the 1962 film. And as great as the music and the lyrics and the humor are on their own, it's really Preston that holds the whole thing together. His energy and charisma make you actually root for the unscrupulous schemer, a feat that just straight up wouldn't work in the hands of most performers. Well, you got trouble, my friend. Right here I say trouble right here in River City. Why, sure, I'm a billiard player. Certainly mighty proud to say I'm always mighty proud to say it. And if you need proof of that, look, I don't want to harp on the 2003 version too much, but... Well, you got trouble, my friend. Right here I say trouble right here in River City. Why, sure, I'm a billiard player. Certainly mighty proud to say I'm always mighty proud to say it. Matthew Broderick's not a terrible choice on paper. He can sing, he can dance, and he can play charming, manipulative liars. And his performance might be considered perfectly fine if we weren't comparing it to Preston. But Broderick's charisma comes from his projection of doe-eyed innocence. Even when he's playing a liar, he gets away with it because people think he couldn't possibly lie. On the other hand, Preston embodies the slick salesman who's always three steps ahead of everyone else. That's not to say the problems with the 2003 version are Broderick's fault. There's a lot of talented people in it, people who I'd absolutely love to see play these roles on stage. But the entire production is such a lower energy version of a show they got right the first time. Look, what do you talk? 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 Where do you get it? What do you talk? 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 Where do you get it? What do you talk? But hey, you're not watching Dave's underwhelming translation of beloved source material of the moment, so let's go back to the 1962 version. Shirley Jones plays Marion Peru, the town librarian and piano teacher who's suspicious of Hill from the start, and who happens to be the title character of the catchiest piece of harassment in the history of music. I love you madly, madly, madam librarian, Marion. If you're gonna fill an entire scene with creepy unwanted advances, the least you can do is choreograph it really, really well. Buddy Hackett plays Harold's confidant Marcellus Washburn, and the townspeople are a who's who of character actors of the day. Paul Ford! Pert Kelton, Mary Wicks, all the familiar faces of the decade. And of course, Marion's little brother Winthrop is an early appearance from a very young Ron Howard, who had only lived in Mayberry about two years at this point. And there's also a cameo from an even younger Patrick Cassidy, like prenatal Patrick Cassidy. Just about every one of these performers is perfectly cast in their roles, even if the characters tend to fall in line with stereotypes, especially the female characters. The stuck-up librarian who's secretly lonely, the meddling mother, the town gossips who are incredibly judgmental of the woman not in their clique. Not necessarily the most flattering roles. But even in their off-the-rack, cliche-ridden existences, they're still given room for growth and dimension. Not quite all of that growth made it into the movie. The 1962 film cut out a reprise of Pick a Little, Talk a Little, where it's revealed that Hill convinced the gossips to actually read the books Marion's been pushing, and they like them, leading to newfound acceptance of the one they previously shunned, and chipping away at Marion's condescension towards their intellect. Yes, everything Hill does is for his own gain, either to increase wealth or evade trouble, but his actions still manage to accidentally improve the community. 
mending friendships, boosting morale, and inciting a sexual revolution among the teenagers. A sexual revolution where they dance to songs with just a little bit of slut shaming. Now, woman who kissed on the very first date is usually a hussy. I'm not gonna pretend that every single aspect of this play has aged spectacularly, but some parts have aged a little too well. Let's dig into You Got Trouble. It's possibly the most iconic song from the show. Maybe Till There Was You Beats It Out, but not the version from the show, just the Beatles cover. And it didn't take long after the play's popularity for the parodies to start coming. Boys, you got a rat right here in Casper City with a capital R, and that stands for rotten, and that rhymes with rodent. And the parodies continue to this day, and not every single one of them is written by Conan O'Brien. Well, we got trouble, my friends! Yes, we got trouble right here at NBC with a capital T and that rhymes with G as in G, we're screwed. And when something's been parodied so many times, it might be easy to lose track of how satirical it was to begin with. If you're in my generation, or even a certain radius around my generation, odds are your first exposure to the Music Man was probably performing it in middle school or high school. And at that age, you might not be aware of how utterly absurd the notion of raising outrage over the addition of a pool table to a billiard hall was. Hill just needed anything even remotely new in town to use for scaremongering, even though the only real addition is now a billiard table has pockets. So now that he's manufactured a corrupting influence, Hill creates moral outrage over nothing by looking for noticeable trends. Words like... Like swell. <laughs> Aha! And so's your old man! <laughs> claiming their symptoms of a darker problem, generally making the people terrified, and then claiming that only he has the solution to these problems. Ah! It's funny and silly, right? Nobody would fall for such an obvious ruse in real life, right? I mean, people are too smart for an obvious con man who panders to irrational fear and then claims only he can save the day despite offering non-sequitur solutions and zero evidence of a tangible plan, right? No wonder the parodies keep coming. But there's one person who never once falls for Hill's lies, Marion. Oh, she does eventually get charmed by him and fall in love with him, but not because she's duped. She has confirmation that he's a fraud before she stops hating him. She knows he's only out for himself, but she sees the positive influence his scam has had on the town, and most importantly on her brother, pulling him out of his shell. For all the movie's cynicism, it does seem to genuinely believe in the power of music to bring people together. Hill's band is basically just a shiny object he can charge the people for, but it gives the kids something to believe in. He turns the school board into a barbershop quartet to distract them from questioning him, but it does genuinely improve the relationship between the four of them. He turns the mayor's wife into the chairman of a dance committee to get her off his back, but the committee gives all the housewives a new outlook on life. And Hill himself didn't even realize he was capable of causing so much good until Marion saw it in him. All of his attempts to seduce her culminate in him falling right under her spell. And when the town turns on him, she stands up for him by reminding them of their newfound improvements. And despite lying about everything, Hill genuinely did put a band together. And it doesn't matter that they don't know what they're doing, they create a sense of community pride to replace the bad kind of pride, the stubborn pride. <laughs> Barney. And they're honestly no worse than most elementary school bands who did receive proper training. But who cares if it's better than the other bands? It's theirs. It's the children they love coming together to create something. And it doesn't have to be genuinely great to be a genuine great source of pride. The combination of catchy songs, witty dialogue, satire that refuses to stop being relevant, and a genuinely sweet center all make The Music Man my favorite musical of all time. And I definitely recommend the 1962 movie version, but even more than that, I recommend seeking out a local production in your area. I know, I know, local theater is always a gamble quality-wise, but as long as it's being performed earnestly by people who care about each other, it's true to the River City spirit. So until next time, this is Dave, signing off.